All right, welcome to the ribs and sternum power plant. What we have here is an elephant, as you probably could have guessed. Um, has a significant amount of ribs on the elephant. Um, protect the internal organs on there. We'll go over the differences um, by the end of the last slide on that. Ribs, typically um, a problem with associated with trauma. Sternum, usually that's a seatbelt injury where the sternum just gets depressed a little bit against there. Um, but they do um, radiograph both of these areas. Um, I would say occasionally. Anatomy, as you already know, there are 12 pairs of ribs. The first seven one, ribs, one through seven, are considered to be true ribs because they connect directly to the sternum. So if you look at them here, and the costal cartilage, those seven vertebrae, or not vertebrae, ribs articulate directly with the sternum. Ribs eight through 12 are considered to be false ribs because they do not connect directly. They kind of go right here. These three, especially, kind of filter into one spot before they kind of piggyback the seventh rib all the way up. Ribs 11 and 12, also designated further as floating ribs as they do not curve around um, or have much cartilage towards the end down there. Um, those are just going to be those two little ribs that just kind of hang out towards the outside. They go posteriorly, but they will not arc around. Costal cartilage makes up the space between the anterior ribs and the sternum. So if you look at these little gray areas over here, that is the cartilage. It may or may not show up depending on if it is calcified or not. You see a little bit better here. This diagram going across uh, provides protective frame around protecting sensitive organs on the inside, including the heart, liver, uh, part of the stomach, pancreas, all that stuff is protected by the rib cage. Uh, each rib drops about three to five inches inferiorly from its highest point. So if we start up here and it curves around, it'll also go down about three to five inches. And that's going to depend on what rib we happen to be looking at. We'll drop even further on that. So just be aware of that um, when you're doing not only your chest x-rays, but your rib exams as well. Uh, costal cartilage will not show up unless it's calcified. So in older patients, sometimes you can see this calcification where it'll get a little bit more dense and you'll actually see it um, outlined a little bit better. But typically, when you look at your chest x-ray, you can see that it just kind of uh, flattens or squares off at these edges because you cannot visualize that costal cartilage there. Widest area of the chest is typically between ribs 8 and 9. So if you look down here, this is going to be your widest point. So when you're looking at your patients, you should not be looking up here to see if they're going to fit on the side. You should be looking down here towards the 8th and 9th ribs. Breathing instructions, it's going to depend on whether we're above the diaphragm or below the diaphragm. But basically, most ribs are going to be on inspiration. The lower ribs, however, will be on expiration. This just shows a little bit of anatomy here, including the uh, sternal end going into the body. You have a angle of the rib, which is going to be a little bit more posterior. There's a little bit of a tubercle, and you have a little bit of a facet here, because as this comes around, it's going to hit the transverse process of the vertebra, and then you'll have another articulation right here that goes right into the body of the vertebrae itself. Um, and depending on which one it is, if it's a demi facet, then it will hit part of this vertebral body here on T5 and maybe a little bit of this part on T4 here. So you can see what these little facets look like. These little facets are for the ribs to kind of come around and articulate with the spine. Views we're going to cover um, PHS, part of most of the rib series, RAO, LAO, AP upper, AP lower. RPO and LPO. These can be done either unilaterally or bilaterally. Most of the time they're done unilaterally because the patient has pain just on one specific side, but occasionally we will do both sides. Only one set of obliques will be done, so we're either going to do the RPO, LPO, or the RAO and LAO. This is just a 3D reconstruction of the CT. You can see these rib fractures right through here. This one's a little displaced. You can see a little jagged edge right across there. That one is broken as well. PA chest, this is usually done just to rule out underlying problems related to potential rib fractures. That means typically pneumothorax or hemopneumothorax. So what we're looking at on a rib fracture with those sharp edges there, is that this sharp edge right here could puncture part of that lung along the inside there. And if it punctures it, what's going to happen, because that lung is normally inflated, it's going to start to deflate as the air kind of seeps out. As it seeps out, it's just like a balloon. It's going to get smaller and smaller. And what happens is you'll see this line going all the way from here all the way down as the lung is kind of deflating. Now you know that this is a pneumothorax because you see the absence of any lung markings towards the outside in here. It's 
sometimes it's a little bit more severe on some patients than others. So you can clearly see these lung markings on here. So you know that this patient does have atrophy of the orthorax. Uh, let's see. 72 inches SID. This is all going to be the same. You're going to do this one on double inspiration, just like normal. RAO, LAO. So this is also going to be done at 72 inches. You're going to do 45 degree patient obliques. It means you're going to be turned in a true oblique. It's going to be a 14 by 17 IR. The longest axis will be top to bottom on here. It's going to be on inspiration. Move the other arm back a little bit to get it out of the way. CR is about T7, but make sure you can see a little bit of light up here. Because sometimes you want to make sure that sometimes you can see the apex, but you can't always see the first rib if you're doing it like a chest x-ray. Like in this case, this first rib is clipped off up on here. So a little bit of extra light just above there. So just raise it up maybe a half inch or maybe an inch just to make sure. Uh, REO position is shown above. So if she's standing here, her right side is against the bucky. REO image shown below without collimation. So if we look here with her standing in an REO position, we are going to shorten the right ribs. Okay. Just to be clear, on an REO position, that is going to shorten the side that's against the bucky on here. Okay. What it's going to do on the opposite side, that's away from the bucky, is it is going to elongate those ribs. So you can see that these ribs are a bit elongated. And both of these obliques are important to be able to see because you might only see a fracture on one of these particular obliques. Uh, let's see. Common injuries, the anterior ribs, more than anterior ribs than the posterior ribs. You can put a lead BB on there somewhere. Usually at the site of most pain, we don't want to put you know BBs all over the place because you're not going to be able to differentiate everything. But one BB on the site where it hurts the most will kind of draw the radiologist's eyes so they can see those potential fractures a little bit easier. Uh, let's see. REO and LAO, just again, foreshorten the side against the bucky, lengthen the side away from it. You're going to do both views staying on the side of inches. So if you were doing right ribs, you're going to have one that looks like this with the right. The REO is going to be this particular view, shortening these ribs. And then you're going to turn the patient the opposite way. And then what you'll get is that with the side away from the board, you will elongate the right side in an LAO positioning. Make sure that you shield all views as well. RPO and LPO are basically the same with one major difference. What's going to happen on this particular view is that everything I just told you about the sides and elongation is going to be flipped backwards. So when we do an RPO position like this patient is standing here, the side that is against the bucky is no longer going to be foreshortened. That side is now going to be elongated, which you see on here. You'll have to probably flip back and forth between these slides and listen to it a couple times to get the understanding um, so that you know the difference between RPO and LPO. So don't be afraid to back this up a little bit. AP cone view. A cone view just means we're going to stick to the one particular side and just get that straight on. Instead of being centered over the middle of the chest on a PA, now we're going to be centered over the middle of those ribs specifically. So maybe adjust the divergence a little bit. It shouldn't change it all that much, but a lot of times I like to collimate in just the one particular side of the ribs on there. Just make sure the arm is moved a little bit to the outside on there. Marker superior and lateral, so there should be some room up here. Again, make sure that you get the very first rib on here. This is rib number two, which is clipped off, which means rib one isn't on there at all. So you need to make sure you center a little bit higher if this is a unilateral right AP cone. AP lower ribs, you should notice on this one, this one's going to be a lot different. You're going to be at a 40 inch SID and you're using a 10 by 12 um, cassette, the 12 inches being lengthwise. This is ribs um, 10 through 12 only. So what we've got on our AP cone view here, we're trying to get one through nine, maybe 10. And this one's going to get the rest from the 10, 11, and 12 on there. This is also going to be done on different breathing instructions. So this is going to be on full expiration. So there's a lot of different SIDs different. IR is different, breathing instructions are different on here as well. You can do this supine or erect, either one is fine. Uh, bottom of the light field should be at the top of the crest. If you look at this image right here, this is the crest here. The ribs are normally not going to extend down into the crest. So if you put the bottom of your light field just about the level of the crest, you should get 12, 11, 10, 9 on there pretty easily. Marker, lower outside corner should be sufficient to get that on. If you are doing a bilateral study, it's obviously not going to fit on a 10 by 12 cassette, so you'll have to use a 14 by 17 
And typically, I'm just going to put that in transverse to get that entire area on there. Sternum, also known as the breastbone, it's a long, narrow, flat bone. You have three parts, the numerum right here, body, this portion right here, and then the xiphoid process, which you should be familiar with if you're a CPR classes, will be the very tip or end of the sternum. So it's basically going to anchor the ribs anteriorly to the thorax. So what it's going to do is when we look at the costal cartilage that comes in here, this is where your clavicle is going to come in at the top. This is where your SC joint is. First, costal cartilage is going to be towards the lateral border of the manubrium here. And then we're going to drop down between the manubrium and the kind of second section of this between the body. And it's going to go two, three, four, five, six, and seven. We'll be right through here. So this is just showing you a nice lateral view of all those facets um, in that particular orientation. Lateral, 72 inches, um, arms behind the uh, back, just kind of puffing out the chest. You want to remove those humerus out of the way. Top of the light field, about an inch and a half above the jugular notch. If you find the jugular notch, you want to get the light field going down here. This is a 10 by 12 going down. You should be able to get the entire cycloid process going all the way across. You can see a broken sternum right through here. You're looking at symmetry and the line going across here. So this fire, the maneuvering looks fine. But this portion of the body, you can see this sharp angle here that has a fracture. Uh, 10 by 12, collimate side to side, adjust the long axis. So it sits, the, sits diagonally. Your long axis should also be diagonally. And then that way you can squeeze in side to side here and side to side here. Shouldn't have all this dead space across in here. Marker, you will have a little bit of light field that shows up on the buses, so make sure that you put it out anteriorly on there as well. The shielding, as always, make sure it's on there. RAO. It's going to be 40 inches, um, 10 by 12. It's going to be lengthwise as well. If you don't know, we're using a breathing technique. We want to blur out the lungs as much as possible so that we can see nice sharp images of this kind of scallop shaped pattern going along the body here, the xiphoid tip, and the maneuverium all the way across on here. This is only a 15 to 20 degree patient angle, no tube angle at all. Um, put the center of the sternum on the center line of the bucky, so you don't even need this light on here. Once you have your light set, just look at the bucky itself, look where the clavicles are, and then put the sternum right in the middle of that. You don't want to get too worried about what you see back here because it might throw you off a little bit. Move the left arm up on the top of the bucky. Typically, I like to move this hand up here, just get that arm out of the way. Marker, a little bit low to the outside because the xiphoid tip is so small. So you usually have room to put your marker somewhere in these areas. One of the hardest views to do, but enough practice, it's really not that difficult. A quick mention about child abuse. Um, U.S. worst among industrialized nations. There's an, um, there's an average between four and seven children every day to child abuse and neglect. So a report of child abuse is made about every 10 seconds. What that means us as technologists is that we need to report any potential incidences of child abuse. Um, this shows right here a two-month-old baby with rib fractures, pleural fusions. You can see the pleural fusion here. The old rib fractures here where the bone is starting to heal. Fractures there, fractures here. Depressed skull fracture right in here. You're not supposed to see those in babies unless they've had some type of abuse or maybe just the way where it is is not indicative of a fall. This just basically says our responsibility. You need to report suspected child abuse, not only of children, but elderly of people, people with disabilities. Um, that needs to be reported. Um, not only to your manager, but you can hire up to the doctor who's attending the patient as well, if you suspect. Um, you can read over that. It's right here, though. 80% of child abuse cases are usually caused by the parents. So be wary of the parents and how they are acting as well. This shows some more rib fractures. You can take a look at these on your own, but you can see these obviously fractures right across here. Bifid rib. Occasionally, when the rib comes out like this, it will split into these kind of two forks going across here. Because the nerves run across there, usually they will have some uh, problems on that. Thoracic outlet syndrome. If they have an extra rib coming off the side, it just kind of hangs out. It doesn't really curve around here. It's just a little extra rib that comes off. That's the thoracic outlet syndrome you may or may not have heard. It only happens to about one half of the people out there. This just shows the sternal foramen. Not really big problem, but something you may see. So I'm assuming someone else will report. An elephant, about 19 to 21 pairs of ribs. 
Just getting this in under 15 minutes. So if you have questions, we'll cover them next.